Well, now we begin my fourth talk. And you'll recall that in the first three, I focused on some of the most important writers in the apophatic tradition from the patristic era to early modern times. In this final lecture, I'll be talking about three from much more recent times. Indeed, the final three mystics who are included in the anthology Light from Light. Two of these, Thomas Merton and Henri Le Sceau, are obviously in the apophatic tradition. But you might be surprised that I've also chosen to consider Thérèse of Lisieux. As you perhaps know, some theologians have even refused to consider her a mystic on the dubious grounds that she led a life free of the presence of, or even the longing for, such extraordinary mystical phenomena as visions or ecstasies. But if one recalls the original meaning of the word mystical, coming from the Greek adjective mystikos, which literally means hidden or secret, and if you recall that in Christianity, this word was first used to refer to an ability to recognize the hidden or secret presence of Christ in all of the Bible, including the Hebrew scriptures, as well as the presence of Christ in the scriptures and in other persons, then it's certain that according to that standard, Therese was very much a mystic. She writes movingly of her awareness of the hidden presence of Jesus in the depths of those sisters in her Carmelite convent, whom she did not find particularly attractive in merely human terms. And she also writes of constantly finding new lights and what she calls hidden meanings as she read the Gospels. Her great love for the writings of John of the Cross, and that at a time before he'd even been named a doctor of the church, is itself strong evidence for placing her in the apophatic tradition. As she writes in her autobiography, Story of a Soul, Ah, how many lights have I not drawn from the works of our Holy Father, St. John of the Cross. At the ages of 17 and 18, I had no other spiritual nourishment. Though she does add that later on it became almost exclusively the Gospels that provided such nourishment. For those given to centering prayer, both John of the Cross and Thérèse of Lisieux provide the strongest possible confirmation of the truth that genuine prayer need not be a matter of words or images. According to John, as I indicated already, the surest sign that a person is called to move away from discursive meditation and pass on to contemplative prayer is that a person wishes to remain alone in loving awareness of God without particular considerations, in interior peace and quiet and repose, and without the acts or exercises of intellect, memory, and will. Such a person, he says, prefers to remain only in a general loving awareness and knowledge of God without any particular knowledge or understanding. He admits that such persons may fear that they're simply being idle because they're not working with their senses or higher faculties, but he insists that they must believe that they're not wasting their time, since their manner of prayer is similar to what the bride in the Song of Songs was talking about when she said, I sleep and my heart keeps watch. John comments, this was like saying, though I sleep according to what I am naturally, by ceasing to work, my heart watches, supernaturally elevated to knowledge of God. Therese, writing of course in a le less doctrinal and more personal way, says much the same thing when she describes what prayer is for her. She writes towards the end of her autobiography, for me, prayer is an aspiration of the heart. It is a simple glance directed to heaven, a cry of gratitude and love in the midst of trial as well as joy. Finally, 
It is something great, supernatural, which expands my soul and unites me to Jesus. She even goes one step further than John in the way she discusses sleep during prayer. For without advocating actual sleep, she nevertheless did not permit herself to become desolate when it occurred. At the beginning of chapter 8 of Story of a Soul, she writes, I should perhaps feel desolate for having slept during my hours of prayer and thanksgivings after communion. Well, I'm not desolate. I remember that little children are as pleasing to their parents when they're asleep as when they're wide awake. And I also remember that the Lord knows our weakness and is mindful that we are only dust and ashes. There's another respect in which Therese mirrors the teaching of John of the Cross, and even without intending to, presents it in a form more in accord with the needs of many people today. You will recall that John's description of what he calls the passive night of the Spirit is one of terrible suffering. He says the soul now, because of its impurity, suffers immensely at the time this divine light assails it. When this pure light strikes in order to expel all impurity, persons feel so unclean and wretched that it seems God is against them and that they're against God. Now, without at all denying that persons today may undergo more or less exactly what John there describes, there's good reason to think that the form the dark night will often take in our day will be in a different mode. A few years ago, the discalced Carmelite, Father Stephen Payne, made a presentation at the annual meeting of the Catholic Theological Society of America that included the following observation. One question I have about the dark night arises directly out of my experience as a spiritual director. I have frequently encountered individuals who exhibit all the classic signs of John's dark nights, yet who do not feel that John's treatise really describes their situation, and so derive little insight from reading his text. It generally has to do with the fact that their own spiritual journey seems to have followed a different course than the ideal San Juanist pattern of ever-deepening commitment to the church and Christian faith. Many are disturbed not by the impression that God has rejected them, but rather by the feeling that God, faith, and prayer may all be illusory. In the Christian kingdom of 16th century Spain, it was hardly possible to doubt the reality of God, so that the anguish of the dark night was experienced primarily as a threat to one's self-esteem, sense of worth, etc. But in the 20th century, the same crisis point may be experienced primarily as a challenge to believe in a loving Lord. When John's account of the sufferings of the passive nights is transposed into this modern key, it seems to accord more closely with the experience of many people today. Hearing these words of Father Payne, one might at once think of Therese's description of her own trial of faith, a passage which is included in our anthology. You'll recall that when she had the first clinical signs of her approaching death from tuberculosis, her immediate reaction was one of great joy, that she would soon be called to that eternal life for which she had staked her all in entering Carmel. But after a few days, that joy passed and she was left only with the terrible fear that heaven was simply a mirage. Her faith for her was now no longer a veil, but what she called a wall, a wall reaching right up to the heavens and covering the starry firmament. Even as death now no longer seemed to her a gateway to eternal life, but a grinning mockery, which personified was saying to her, you're dreaming about the light, about a fatherland embalmed in the sweetest perfumes. Advance, advance. 
rejoice in death, which will give you not what you hope for, but a night still more profound, the night of nothingness. How Therese dealt with this trial provides a lesson for all of us. She no longer had the joy of faith, but she did everything possible at least to carry out its works. Never before, she says, had she made more acts of faith than during this lengthy period of trial, which actually lasted right up to the time of her death. And as for what she calls the works of faith, she continued as unstintingly as ever, trying to carry out what she knew was the new commandment of Jesus, that we not merely love our neighbor as ourselves, but that we love one another as Jesus loved us. The practical and truly heroic way she did this is again a model for us all. She notes that we naturally seek out the company of those who are saintly and affable, and we tend to avoid the company of those who are less perfect and, humanly speaking, more disagreeable. But these are the ones she would seek out, knowing that a word or an amiable smile would often suffice to make what she called these wounded souls blossom, and would in any case give joy to Jesus and respond to the example and counsel he gave us in the Gospels. Here again, then, we see that the final criterion of our prayer is not what we do or do not experience during the time of prayer, but how we live day in and day out, especially in our relationships with others. In the words of the fine theologian and historian of Christian spirituality, Louis Bouillet, the main thing is to be fully convinced that Christ is living in us and especially to act accordingly, not to experience more or less directly the feeling that this is so. Like Therese, the next figure I'll discuss, Thomas Merton, also had a great liking for the works of John of the Cross and even wrote a book about them, though not one of his better books simply because it was written in a scholastic style that was not Merton's strength. His attraction to the apophatic tradition was also evident in a remark he once made in a conference to his novices at the Abbey of Gethsemane where he said he regretted having been born in the 20th century and that if he had been given the choice, he would have chosen the 14th. Why? Because that was the century of Eckhart and Roosbrook and of Eckhart's disciples, Towler and Suzo. Even the few selections from his voluminous writings that we included in the anthology manifest these apophatic leanings especially the following lines from the passage taken from New Seeds of Contemplation, where he writes, It is our emptiness in the presence of the abyss of God's reality, our silence in the presence of his infinitely rich silence, our joy in the bosom of the serene darkness in which his light holds us absorbed, it is all this that praises God. This clear darkness of God is the purity of heart that Christ spoke of in the sixth beatitude. And this purity of heart brings at least a momentary deliverance from images and concepts, from the forms and shadows of all the things people desire with their human appetites. It brings deliverance even from the feeble and delusive analogies we ordinarily use to arrive at God. Not that it denies these, for they're true as far as they go, but it makes them temporarily useless by fulfilling them all in the sure grasp of a deep and penetrating experience. And it was in accord with this teaching that Merton himself prayed. As you probably know, he ordinarily didn't speak about this in any detail, but we can thank his friendship with the Pakistani Sufi scholar, Abdul Aziz, for providing an occasion for him to do so. Abdul Aziz had written Merton, asking him, among other things, about his way of prayer and meditation, and that request brought the following reply. 
whose similarity to centering prayer is obvious, even to the extent that Merton twice uses the participle centered and once the noun center in this short passage. Strictly speaking, he says, I have a very simple way of prayer. It is centered entirely on attention to the presence of God and to his will and his love. That is to say that it is centered on faith by which alone we can know the presence of God. One might say that this gives my meditation the character described by the prophet Muhammad as being before God as if you saw him. Yet it does not mean imagining anything or conceiving a precise image of God, for to my mind that would be a kind of idolatry. On the contrary, it is a matter of adoring God as invisible and infinitely beyond our comprehension and realizing him as all. There is in my heart this great thirst to recognize totally the nothingness of all that is not God. My prayer is then a kind of praise rising up out of the center of nothing and silence. Such is my ordinary way of prayer or meditation. It is not thinking about anything, but a direct seeking of the face of the invisible. And this cannot be found unless we become lost in him who is invisible. His affinity with the apophatic tradition is clear not only in the way he here describes his prayer as adoring God infinitely beyond our comprehension, but also in the way he emphasizes love as the core of the contemplative way, just as the author of The Cloud of Unknowing consistently taught that the God whom we cannot comprehend by concepts, we can embrace in love. And so Merton, in one of the passages in our anthology, writes, In the vivid darkness of God within us, there sometimes come deep movements of love that deliver us entirely, at least for a moment, from our old burden of selfishness and number us among those little children of whom is the kingdom of heaven. But I think even more striking in this regard is the final conference he gave to his novices at the Abbey of Gethsemane the very day before he took up permanent residence in his hermitage in August 1965. This conference, which was later published in the journal Cistercian Studies in 1970, was therefore a kind of valedictory address to the novices, in which, it seems to me, Merton wanted to convey to them what he considered most important of all about the contemplative life. And the gist of his message, based on Jean-Pierre de Cossade's teaching about self-abandonment, is that we need not and must not let ourselves become care-ridden or anxious about anything at all, since God has taken upon himself the care of all our affairs. He continued, this is what love is. Let us face the fact for once that what we're here for is love. And what is love? When you love another person, you simply forget yourself and think about the other. And if you love this other person and know that it's mutual, then you know that the other is thinking about you. And so you're no longer worrying even about whether you're virtuous or not. You just live. You live without care. Of the many conferences by Merton that I've read or heard on audio cassettes, that one is my favorite. And it's perhaps also the one that has most to say to us about the real heart of contemplative life and the apophatic way. And now last I come to the figure who concludes our anthology and who actually rivaled Dionysius and Eckhart in the apophatic tenor of some of his expressions. Henri Lasso lived as an almost exact contemporary of Merton, but is not nearly as well known, at least not in our country. Born in Brittany in 1910, he entered a Benedictine monastery there when he was in his late teens, and for about 20 years served the community as librarian 
and as an instructor of the novices in canon law and church history. But he soon felt a strong call to go to India and found a monastic community that would help fashion a Christian India. And so finally, after World War II, he got his abbot's permission to go there. And soon, in the company of another French priest who was already living in that subcontinent, he set up an ashram along the banks of the River Kaveri in South India. A visit to the holy mountain of Arunachala and his acquaintance with a Hindu holy man who lived there soon led Lasso to drop the ambition of being a missionary in any normal sense of the word and to become what he himself called in a letter to his sister a poor Christian monk in the midst of Hindu monks. His best known book translated into English under the title Satchidananda, sought to show how the non-dualistic experience of so many Hindu sages was in fact converging on the historical Christ, a position that he and others at that time called a theology of fulfillment. However, he soon came to feel that even this approach did not go far enough and in texts that did not gain favor with some of his ecclesiastical censors, he began suggesting that each of the great world religions is altogether true and valid for those in its own line, and that each practitioner should simply hold fast to his or her own line of development, the one marked out already from one's mother's lap. In the final years of his life, he lived more and more as a hermit, along the Ganges in northern India, having left the ashram in the south in the care of B. Griffiths. But even as a hermit, Lusso, or to call him by the Indian name he adopted, Abhishekdananda, the bliss of the anointed one, he continued to be of service to the post-Vatican II church in India. He would regularly give conferences to religious communities he helped the Indian Bishops' Conference with their challenge to develop an authentically Indian rite of the Eucharist, and he wrote many letters of spiritual direction published after his death of a heart attack in 1973. For our purposes, what is of greatest importance and interest is, of course, the apophatic nature of his thought and experience. In lengthy periods of isolated retreat on this mountain, Arunachala, and elsewhere, he came to experience the one to whom he had formerly prayed in Brittany as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God whom Jesus called Abba, began to experience this one now also as simply the beyond, the one indeed manifested in some degree in the names and forms of the various religious traditions, but not really comprehended by any of them. This might sound like nothing more than the apophatic doctrine that one could find in any textbook of systematic theology, but for Abhishek Dananda there was a crucial difference. In his view, for most theologians, the incomprehensibility of God is just a concept itself, an idea, what he called the apophaticism of theology. Whereas, he says, only when the soul has undergone the experience that the name beyond all names can be pronounced only in the silence of the spirit, does it become capable of that total openness which permits one to perceive the mystery in its sign. He didn't believe that his experience of this was in any way unique within Christianity, and he would at times draw on the teachings of earlier figures to support his arguments. In one of his essays, for example, he writes of this apophatic experience that though it avoids the notion and name of God, it draws one nearer to the divine mystery than any experience that depends on names and images. We re remember here the teaching of John of the Cross and the drastic purification of all mental symbols that John calls the dark night of the soul. That's from one of Lasso's essays. But generally, he avoided quoting earlier Christian writers, since he feared that their terminology, often drawn from scholastic philosophy, 
burdened them with unnecessary struggles to express what he found more naturally formulated in many of their Indian counterparts. But even words from the Indian religion classics came to mean less and less to him as he grew older. And true to that apophatic impulse, he wrote and spoke less and less. After once having agreed to give a lecture on the Trinity at the Jesuit Theological Faculty in Delhi, he began to regret that commitment. And he wrote to a friend, I'm a little anxious about these lectures on the Trinity. What can I say now? Lead them to the open sea with all moorings severed? Nothing comes that worth saying. When it comes to it, I shall just have to be ready to speak without any particular preparation. In fact, a deep appreciation of silence was what he considered India's major contribution to the church as a whole. Now, it may well be that the writings of this particular author are not as attractive to you as those of someone like the author of The Cloud or Thomas Merton. And it may also be that Abhishek Dananda's felt need to spend his adult years in a foreign country seems alien or at least impossible to you in your present circumstances. But I do believe that this man has a lot to teach those who are practicing centering prayer. One of the major themes of this entire institute has been that the way of contemplative prayer is the way of love. And in this respect, Abhishek Dananda is at one with everyone else we've been studying. He made a point of insisting, and I quote, Jesus did not cudgel his brains to make a philosophy about his non-dualistic union with God. He taught his people to live simply but deeply a life of loving union with their brothers and sisters, a life of self-giving without limit. And for Abhishek Dananda, these were not just pious musings. The poverty of so many people in India never ceased to touch him. And to the end of his life, he continued to give help from his own meager funds to a family in South India who he knew were in difficult circumstances. He also fully recognized that many people who might have liked to follow him to India would not be able to do so for one reason or another. And he knew that in the final analysis, earthly geography is not all that important. India, he once wrote, is wherever you find the Lord of the inmost depth, the Lord of the cave. And the cave is the deepest center of your heart and the deepest center of the Father's heart. Live there whatever be your circumstances. And for you, for me, we may enter and live in that cave wherever and whenever we practice centering prayer and wherever and whenever we give even a cup of cold water to the least of Christ's brothers and sisters, knowing that in serving them, we are serving Christ himself. That at least is one kind of knowing very much at the center of Christian faith, and so at the center of the apophatic way of contemplative prayer. If these talks of mine have encouraged you and your perseverance along this way, they will have done all I could possibly have wished for. <laughs>